Matthew's, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24. I thought the Bible said, let the women keep silent, but I guess not. <laughs> You know what, I'm running, I'm running out of real estate up here. All right, Matthew 24, just before I begin reading, I thought I would uh, just share a little a book here called, it's Charting the Bible Chronologically, A Visual Guide to God's Unfolding Plan. Uh, this is written by Ed Hinson and Thomas Ice as an excellent book on the whole plan of God through history, particularly on matters of prophecy. And it is filled with some beautiful uh, charts that they put together, which sort of summarize broad sections of history and prophecy. So if you don't have this book and are interested in this subject, this is certainly worthwhile uh, getting. You can get it at Gospel Folio Press. And uh, if you use Danielle, you can get free shipping. That's up until Labor Day. <laughs> Now, we don't know when Labor Day is, however. <laughs> it's like the rapture. It could happen at any moment, even tonight while we're here. So don't delay if you want free shipping in getting that book. Matthew chapter 24, and we'll begin reading at verse 1. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, do you, uh, do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, as he sat at the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Let him who is in the field go not back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and those with nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. Unless those days were short, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders, so as to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. 
Therefore, if they say to you, look, he is in the desert, do not go out. Or look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Misunderstanding scripture is the worst kind of misunderstanding because of its eternal consequences. A lot of things we can misunderstand in life. We can misunderstand directions as to how to get to a place. We can misunderstand the uh, directions on how to bake a cake. We can misunderstand a lot of things in life. In fact, there are many things in life that we, we don't really fully grasp until we've had some of life's experiences that no amount of education can prepare us for certain things. And we often go through life misunderstanding things that is cured only by experience. But the consequences of most of these kinds of misunderstandings are merely temporal. And in the big scheme of things are minor. But to misunderstand scripture, the consequences are of eternal significance. We sometimes use the expression when something goes bad or goes wrong, we say, well, it's not the end of the world. Well, in this case, it is the end of the world that we're talking about. Misunderstanding scripture is the worst kind of misunderstanding. Now, such misunderstanding can be avoided or limited when we, when we are observant in the study and reading of scriptures and when we learn how to uh, read and think about scripture. Because the Bible is a divine revelation. It, it, it's not given uh, to make things complicated. It's not given to obscure or to hide from view. It's given as a divine revelation, but it does require diligence in reading and thinking and study. And the amazing thing about the divine revelation is that, that it is comprehensible by all believers if we are willing to do the necessary work. There are a number of resources available to us. First of all, we have, of course, the written word available in our own language. That's the first thing. Secondly, we have the Holy Spirit that dwells within us, that does his work of illumination. Thirdly, we have those gifted around us to teach the word of God in fellowship in the local church. So all of these things contribute and feed our understanding of scripture. And so when we're diligent in observation in study and reading and, and when all believers learn how to read and think about scripture, misunderstanding can be avoided. We must never try and make scripture say something that it does not say. There's a great danger and great harm has been done to the church when those in a place of, of teaching, I suppose, have either intentionally or unintentionally made the Bible say something that it doesn't really say. In other words, we can't put words in God's mouth. And so we have to be careful that we are understanding scripture uh, carefully. And the Olivet Discourse is an example of common misunderstanding. These verses that we have read, the beginning part of, of the Olivet Discourse, a discourse, a, a talk given, given by the Lord to his disciples at the Mount of Olives, hence the name, the Olivet Discourse. It's an example of common misunderstandings. There are many verses that are quoted from this section of scripture and the rest of it that we'll look at in the weeks that follow. Uh, where application is made, for example, to our present era, our present church age. And I want to put to you that in the Olivet Discourse, the Lord is not talking about our present age or the church age. He's talking about a time yet to come, the tribulation period and the close of the tribulation period. And so we'll look at some of these examples as we go through it and see what the application is for us today and what the application will be uh, in a future day. So 
Lewis Sperry Schaefer has, uh, let me get rid of that there. Lewis Sperry Schaefer is a, uh, a well-known Bible teacher of the last century. He is credited with the founding uh, of the Dallas uh, Theological Seminary. And uh, he wrote these words, which I'm trying to read without all the stuff that's on my screen here. You know, the Apostle Paul never had this problem. <laughs> I've got it in my, in my footnotes here. Yeah, Spacer, uh, Schaefer wrote these words, the general theme concerning the return of Christ has a unique distinction of being the first prophecy uttered by man. Jude 1, 14 and 15. And the last message from the ascended Christ, as well as being the last word of the Bible, Revelation 22. Likewise, the theme of the second coming of Christ is unique because of the fact that it occupies a larger part of the text of scriptures than any other doctrine. And it is the outstanding theme of prophecy in both the Old and New Testaments. In fact, all of the prophecy largely contributes to the one great end of the complete setting forth of this crowning event, the second coming of Christ. Now that's what we're thinking about, is the first and the last prophecy of the Bible, the coming again of Jesus Christ to this world. And this is what the Lord is speaking about here in the Olivet Discourse, the signs that will precede the second uh, coming. Likewise, uh, Dr. Tim LaHaye wrote, the Olivet Discourse delivered shortly before Jesus' crucifixion is the most important single passage of prophecy in all the Bible. It is significant because it came from Jesus himself immediately after he was rejected by his own people and because it provides the master outline of end time events. It is focused, it is brought into clear focus in these chapters, Matthew 24 and 25. Another quote by Thomas Ice, one of the authors of this book. He says, the Olivet Discourse is an important passage for the development of anyone's view of Bible prophecy. The Olivet Discourse is made up of our Lord's teaching on Bible prophecy that is found in Matthew 24 and 25, Mark 13 and Luke 21. One's interpretation of the Olivet Discourse greatly impacts whether they are a premillennialist, an anti-millennialist, a futurist, a preterist, or pre-tribulationists or post-tribulationists. Now you say, well, what on earth does that mean? What do those big theological terms mean? We might think, well, I've got other things to think about. I'm trying to deal with the crabgrass in my front lawn and I'm trying to feed my kids and I'm trying to work my job and oh, 101 other problems. I don't have time to think about uh, pre-tribulationists or post-tribulationists. Well, those are words that are used to describe an understanding of the Bible, and it's in vitally important that we understand the significance of things to come because they have an impact here and now on how we live. In fact, the import of the Bible is that we are heading towards a kingdom age when our Lord Jesus Christ is going to reign and rule. We call it the millennial or the millennium. And we are now in preparation for that age in this church age in which we live. He is preparing us all in our lives, in our life circumstances, in our response to things. There is meaning for what we experience here in this life and it is shaping us and preparing us as to what role we will play in that coming kingdom and the eternal state. It helps to explain some of the difficulties and trials of life that we face. We are, as they used to often say, training for reigning. That's what's going on in your life and in mine right now. This life is not all there is. This is not the big thing. This is merely the preparation. There's an old hymn that speaks about uh, the, the, the eternity, and there's a line in it that says, it's school day's all gone. I used to love that line as a kid listening to that. <laughs> school day's all gone. Well, and there's a sense in which one day are school days. The difficulty of school days will be gone, and we will reign with Christ during the millennial reign. 
And an understanding of Bible prophecy, an understanding of this particular uh, discourse by the Lord is vitally important. It's important that we understand why we claim to be pre-tribulation and pre-millennial in our understanding of end time events. It matters. It's not a question of saying, well, we'll, fit, we'll, real, we'll figure it all out when we get there. Then we'll know. Up till now, I'm not going to think about it. It doesn't work that way. That's not how God has revealed his truth to us. If it was unimportant, why did the Lord spend so much time with his disciples outlining the details of these things? It's vitally important that we have clarity on these uh, issues. Now, the context of this particular uh, discourse in Matthew might be looked at uh, this way. Uh, the Olivet Discourse is one of five major discourses in Matthew, and each concludes with when Jesus had finished all these uh, sayings. And reading through the whole Gospel of Matthew, you find there are times when the Lord spoke to the people or spoke to his disciples. And Matthew concludes the section with when Jesus had ended these sayings or made an end of commanding his disciples or finished these parables. And the experts tell us that these are literary devices that are intended to be markers in the thought flow and understanding uh, the, the, the gospel itself. Now, if, if this was being written in, in a modern style, if we were writing this down, or if Matthew was even writing this down today, he, he might have some headings. He might have some bold headings that talked about the different sections. But that's not how they wrote in the first century. They use these literary devices that are identified, and the brilliance of them is that it, it, it's, it survives centuries of time and different styles in different cultures. And even though we're not experts in Greek, and we're not reading this in Greek, and we're reading an English transla translation, the methodology still comes through. And so reading this in English, we can see this. And if you keep reading Matthew's gospel, you'll notice the repetition of this expression. And so we have these five discourses, and they all have to do with the kingdom, the coming kingdom, the, the righteousness of the kingdom, Matthew 5 to 7, known as the Sermon on the Mount, the, the commission to preach the gospel of the kingdom in that day in Matthew 10, the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, including its postponement. The Lord said that the kingdom was there in his day, yet the kingdom didn't come. And the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, we realize there is a, a postponement of the arrival of the kingdom of heaven and an intervening age in which we are now living. The humility essential to the kingdom in Matthew 18, and then the end of the age and the coming of the kingdom here uh, in the Olivet uh, Discourse. Now, this comes at a time in Matthew's gospel when we see the conclusion of Israel's rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ as the promised king. And this is critical to the flow of Matthew's gospel. And that's what's happening now. Israel has officially uh, rejected uh, the Lord's offer of himself as the kingdom. Matthew 23 is the chapter that speaks about the woes to the scribes and the Pharisees. You may be familiar with that. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. These were the leaders of Israel who officially represented Israel and officially uh, cast their decision as to who the Lord Jesus Christ really is. And their decision was to reject him. As we know, they were instrumental in leading to his crucifixion. And that the nation officially rejected the Lord Jesus Christ in his offer to be the king and the, establish, and the establishment of the kingdom. If we go to the end of chapter 23 and reading at verse 37, we read these words, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, that last statement, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, is a quotation from Psalm 118. 
Go back for a moment to Psalm 118. Psalm 118. And you'll notice at verse 22. Psalm 118, 22. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And Psalm 118 is prophetic. It's the words that will be spoken by Israel when the Lord Jesus Christ comes again. And they realize that he was the, the king. He, was, he is the king. He is the Messiah. And they will receive him then. They will say the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. They will say the builders who in a past generation rejected him when he came the first time. We now see he is the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Now, this will be an Israel that has been beaten down through the terrible atrocities of the tribulation period. And they will be brought to complete and utter brokenness and repentance before God. An Israel that had wandered far away from God through the chastening process of the tribulation period will return to him and they will bow before him and they will welcome the Lord Jesus Christ. They will say, this is the day. Uh, verse 23, this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Now we sometimes sing that chorus, don't we? This is the day, this is the day. I won't sing it for you, but you know it, right? And if you're ever, ever having sort of a bad day and you start griping about the bad day and someone says to you, well, this is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I would say just vent your feelings that day and say, that's not what that verse means. That's for the time when the Lord comes. And if I want to enjoy my bad day and be grumpy, I should be allowed to do that, you see. This is what they will say in a future day. But he says, you will see me no more till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That condition was not met when the Lord came the first time, but it will be met at the close of the tribulation period. Now, <clears throat> you will notice the section that we're looking at in those verses. Notice that, uh, that expression, uh, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together? And the word there is uh, episynago. It's a word used for the synagogue, the gathering together of people. And the Lord appeals to his people. He says, how I, I would have gathered you together. I want, wanted to receive you, but you needed to receive me. But they would not. And then notice in, in uh, verse 31 of chapter 24, it says, and he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together. The same word, episynago, is elect from the four winds from the, the one end of heaven to another. When the Lord comes again, he is going to gather together the nation of Israel from all over the world and they will receive him. They will gather together and they will be willing to come to him. And it's the sharp contrast from his first coming and his second coming. John Walford writes these words, probably no words of Jesus in his public ministry are more eloquent than these. Here's the reve here's revealed the breaking heart of God over a people whom he loved. And yet a people who spurned that love and killed those whom he sent to them. The chapter that holds the most severe indictment of any of Christ's discourses ends with one of his greatest expressions of sorrow. The repetition of Jerusalem signifies the deep emotion in which Jesus spoke. These are profound words as he looks upon his people. He had done so much for those people. The whole course of human history has Israel as the chief instrument through which God would work out his purposes that will go to eternity. And here his people spurned his love and uh, rejected him. 
That's a challenge for us to think about as well. We too are God's people as the church of Jesus Christ. And he too has extended his love to us. And he too has a purpose in calling the church out, the bride of Christ to also fulfill a purpose. And so the challenge is, would he ever say these words to us? Have we rejected him? I'm not saying, I'm not asking you as an unbeliever. I'm asking you as a believer. As believers, have we rejected him? To wound the heart of God, the one who has loved us so. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. He didn't say, if you love me, talk about me. He didn't, he, he didn't say, say get, get all your theology right. Although that's all part of it. He says, if you love me, keep my uh, commandments. Well, one last point for tonight, and that will sort of be the introduction. The verses that we have read from verse 1 of chapter 24 down to verse 31 are all could be described this way, events described by way of prophecy. So these are all things that are going to happen, he said, particularly at the close of the tribulation period. We find the first three and a half years of the tribulation uh, from verses 1 to 14, and there are several things that are mentioned there. We'll look at some of those next week. We have the midpoint of the tribulation, the crisis event, when the covenant is broken with Israel. We'll see what that is, uh, and the a reference to Daniel. And then the last three and a half years of the tribulation known as the great tribulation. And finally, the end of the tribulation, and the Son of Man shall come. So from verses 1 to 31, we have this de description, this ex events described uh, by way of prophecy. Events described uh, by way of prophecy. And then, uh, we'll come back to that in a moment. And then in the second part of the uh, section, we find there are exhortations beginning at verse 32, where it says, now learn this parable from the fig tree, from verse 32 to the end of chapter 24, and all through chapter 25, we have exhortations made by way of parable. In other words, the Lord uses parables or illustrations or examples, and there's an exhortation. There's a call to action. There's a call to respond. So the first one is a description of events that are going to occur. And he uses prophecy. He is telling us things uh, that, that can only be understood supernaturally by divine revelation. We are looking into the future. There's no way anyone unaided by divine revelation could ever know any of these things. This is all divine revelation. It's prophecy. And it's events that are going to occur. In the second part of the discourse, he goes through a number of parables or examples or illustrations, and he exhorts the people of that day as to how they should respond. And we'll notice as we go through them, we'll see there's application to us. Even though it is not written to us, here and now, even though this is describing the tribulation period and everything must be understood in the context of the tribulation period. And we'll look at some examples next week where it is often misquoted that these verses are taken out of their context and try, uh, that's, and, and they try to apply them to the present day. And it leads to all kinds of confusion and misunderstanding of scripture. So we wanna keep it clear and understand the application. Well, well, we'll leave it there for now, and we'll pick it up uh, next week on this uh, understanding and misunderstanding the Bible. By the way, I've spoken to one of our many faithful deacons, and they assure me they're going to get the air conditioning schedule working for the evening meetings going forward. So uh, not to, put, on, not, not to too, put too much pressure on them. Well, actually, that, that was intended to put a lot of pressure on them, but anyway. All right, let's close in prayer. Father. How thankful we are for the privilege of being able to meet together. And we're thankful, Father, for the availability of Holy Scripture in our own language. And we're thankful for the many aids we have in, in understanding it. We pray that we might be diligent and apply ourselves to this reading of Scripture and pray that it might have its intended effect upon all of our lives, that we might be in tune with all that God has, uh, uh, that all God is planning 
in the days to come, that we might live here and now in light of that. And as we look at some of the challenges that are put before those of us living in the church age, in light of the age to come. We ask thy blessing now upon us as we part in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and to his honor and glory. Amen.